The true self-conscious existence which spirit receives in speech, which is not the utterance of an alien and therefore contingent, not universal self-consciousness, is the work of art we met with before. It stands in contrast to the thing-like character of the statue. Whereas this exists at rest, speech is a vanishing existence. And whereas in the statue, the liberated objectivity lacks an immediate self of its own, in speech, on the other hand, objectivity remains too much shut up within the self, falls short of attaining a lasting shape, and is, like time, no longer immediately present in the very moment of its being present. Paragraph 713 is very short, and there's not an awful lot going on in it in terms of development, but there's an important contrast that is being made, which is going to play into the following paragraphs. They're going to be consolidated into what, what Hegel is calling the cult, in German, the cultus. And what we're seeing here is two different manners in which language, sprache or utterance is another way of translating it here. They're both sprache in the German are being used and they're played off of each other. So he says that the true self-conscious existence, which spirit receives in speech, in language, in sprache, right? Which is not the utterance. And here we get a, a sentence that's a little bit clumsy in its construction that we're going to have to clarify a little bit. So let's pause first on thinking about this, the true self-conscious existence. So existence is Dasein and you know, the, that's meaning a being within, you know, our experience, the world, right? And it's true. It's, it's vara, it's self-conscious, Selbstbewusst, right? Um, it's conscious of itself and of its relations to others. So spirit takes this on. Spirit has this capacity within language, not just by itself, not just say through perception or thought, but through this medium that constitutes language or here speech. Now the rest of it reads like this, which is not the utterance of an alien and therefore contingent, not universal consciousness is the work of art we met with before. So that whole big clause there is a little bit tricky, not the utterance of, and then, you know, ist nicht, right, is in the German. And all of this stuff is what it is not. So Hegel is not saying that the true self-conscious existence is not universal self-consciousness. That's not how you should be reading that little sentence there. He's saying that it's not, and now we're putting all these things into one basket, the utterance of an alien, fremd, we've seen this in the, the last three paragraphs, it's not the utterance or the speech, the language, the, the spraka of alien and therefore also, right? Contingent, zufällige, not universal, uh, nicht allgemeine self-consciousness. So it's not the utterance, we might rephrase this, it's not the utterance of an alien and therefore contingent self-consciousness, which would not be universal. So once you read it that way, it probably makes a little bit more sense. I don't want to criticize Miller for how he's translated it, having translated many things myself, but it is kind of a clumsy construction that lends itself to some, some misunderstandings. What are on the bookends of that? The true self-conscious existence is the work of art we met with before. And then he says, it stands in contrast to the thing like, Dingliche, character of the statue. Bildsäule. Now this is kind of an interesting word here because it does mean statue, right? But it can also mean ornamental column. So there's a nice ambiguity here in thinking about not just the, the statue in the middle of the temple, but maybe also of the architectural features of the temple, which are static. 
however dynamic they may be in their design, they are static in that they present themselves to us. And, and that's why we can go to ruins of temples from long ago and, you know, whatever's still left over is still there. By contrast, language is, as Hegel's going to say, it's more like what? Like time, time itself. How so? Well, language exists in time, but it exists in time in a way different than physical objects do. You know, physical objects like statues. You could say, well, language is itself a physical object. Yes, it is waves in the air. That's true. And you can write it down. And those are through the media of physical objects. But language itself is not a physical object. I'm actually reminded here of something quite interesting. You know, the Stoics, who Hegel isn't talking about here and, and kind of gets wrong earlier in the phenomenology, uh, and, and he wouldn't know this really from, uh, I think, his studies, but the Stoics, you know, they were materialists, but they didn't say that everything was matter. There were also the immaterials, and those included the lectone, right? What What is spoken, um, there's a lot more to be said about that, but in any case, language, at least in this passage, it doesn't have the kind of thingliness that the statue does. So what's the contrast here? He says, whereas the statue exists at rest, and he just says, you know, ruined. It doesn't, he doesn't actually say it exists as such. Uh, speech is a vanishing existence. Now he uses the word Dasein there and for Verschwindende, right? Uh, disappearing, vanishing. How so? Well, I mean, consider this. We're recording my speech right now. Hegel has recorded his language, his Sprache in the form of, I mean, he didn't write in English and he certainly didn't write in, in this kind of script. He wrote in a different kind of script, but it, you know, you get the idea it's preserved. Um, but when you're reading, you're moving from one word to the next, right? You can say, well, same thing with the statue. I, I move around it. I'm looking at this side. Now I'm looking at this side, or I'm looking at the head and now I'm looking at the feet or the base. And now I'm looking at the stuff in between, right? The light changes, the statue changes its aspect. That's true, but it's not the same. It's not even remotely close to what language is like. Language is much more like a, a stream that you're in and it's flowing and you're grabbing stuff and trying to make sense of it as it's going on. What did I say five minutes ago? Do you know? I don't know offhand. Um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things that are vanishing away as we're using it. And yet it's almost like a miracle that the sense, the meaning in language remains as we're talking through things. So he says, speech is a vanishing existence, whereas in the statue, the liberated objectivity, Gegenständlichkeit, right, being an object, lacks an immediate self of its own in speech, this is a really interesting thing to say. Objectivity remains too much shut up within the self. So the self is what comes to dominate, right? Objectivity is getting itself lost within the self. And he says, falls short of attaining a lasting shape and is like time no longer immediately present in the very moment of its being present. Think back to sense certainty, right? Now, now is gone. By the very time that you register me saying now, that now is gone and we've got a different now. And we can say that now becomes a kind of generality. Yes, true. It's an indexical word, a, a dictic, if you like. Uh, but it, it only functions by not being where it's supposed to be in time. And it's similar with Language. Hegel is on to something quite interesting here that's going to be talked about quite a bit by linguists later on in the, you know, late 19th and, and the, the 20th century. He's not really going to exploit that too much. He's, he's got other fish to fry, so to speak. But that's part of what's going on here in this very short section.
The movement of the two sides constitutes the cult, a movement in which the divine shape and motion in the pure feeling element of self-consciousness and the divine shape at rest in the element of thinghood mutually surrender their distinctive characters and the unity which is the notion of their essence achieves an existence. In the cult, the self gives itself the consciousness of the divine being descending to it from its remoteness and this divine being which formerly was not actual but only an object against it through this act receives the actuality proper to self-consciousness. Now in paragraph 714 these distinctions that we've been making for the last several paragraphs between the statue with its thingliness and objectivity, Gegenständlichkeit, and language being used to not just designate, but also to, you might say, enact and provide a place for the universal, the self. These are brought together in something that Hegel is calling the cult. And right off the bat, I've mentioned this before in previous videos. When we see this term in the 21st century in English, we often think of particular religions that are, you know, we, we say they're cultish and what do we mean by that? They're kind of closed in on themselves and they suck people into their organization, don't let them get out, exploit them, are hostile towards the outside world. Put that aside. That, that is not what Hegel's talking about here. The cult just means any sort of community of worship. And we should say one other thing about this as well that might help you to, to understand this. So a community of worship in the classic sense is not simply um, centering around, say, the religion or the God or something like that. And, you know, oh, we're not worthy. We're just garbage. You know, here's your offerings or something like that. If you actually look at religions as they were practiced, there is a sense that the gods are, you know, better, greater. There's something going on there. You have to watch out for what you're doing. But there's also a sense in which the community is connected with that God in some way, is welcoming them or treating them like a guest or perhaps propitiating them like somebody who could easily lose their temper, but you can in fact work with. So there's also this sense in which the, the God is no longer totally alien, totally other, as some people, you know, like to make religion out to be. There's a familiarity going on there as well. So he says, the movement, the bewegung of the two sides, or both sides, the beide, right, constitutes the cult, a movement, he says, in which the divine shape in motion, in the pure feeling element of self-consciousness. So we got one side over here, right? Uh, the divine shape, the gestalt, uh, in, in motion. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then we've got another side over here, the divine shape at rest. The divine shape in the form of the statuary or the temple, whatever, whatever it happens to be. He says, at rest in the element of thinghood. So what we've got here is motion and rest being brought together, right? And we also have, as he says, elements in the element, elementa of self-consciousness, the pure feeling empfindung in this case, but it's also linguistic as we saw <clears throat> in just the previous paragraphs of self-consciousness. So that, that's one side over here. The divine is indeed self-conscious. It is indeed universal. Over here on the other side, we have the element of thinghood, dingheit. He doesn't say gegenständlichkeit, but he said that just in the previous paragraph. So we could read that in as well. And these are being brought together, right? The movement of both sides. And what is the movement? He says that there is, here's where it gets really interesting. Um, they mutually surrender their distinctive characters, their 
ways in which they are distinct from each other, um, they're particularities, you could say. They mutually surrender them to each other, right? So there's kind of a fusion going on here. Or if you like, he doesn't use the word synthesis, but we could call this a synthesizing uh, moment within the dialectic. And then he goes on and he says, oh, this is really important. The unity, which is the notion of their essence, achieves an existence. In the German, it's actually a little bit more dynamic. He says that the unity achieves an, an existence, a Dasein. And then he goes on to tell us what this unity is. The notion of their essence, the Wesen, right? So we have essence and existence and notion, begriff, all being brought together into this in, again, a kind of unity. Now, achieving or coming to existence is going to be connected with another term that he's finishing up with, actuality, wirklichkeit. So many times we've seen this arising within the phenomenology, haven't we? That whatever is there in essence or there in mere notion has to be brought to actuality or reality or to existence. And then we know what it actually is, right? So he goes on and he says, um, in the cult, the self gives itself the consciousness of the divine being descending to it from its remoteness. So that's one side, right? The divine being is descending to the self and the self is the worshiper, the participant in the cult, the, the leader of the worship service, but also the God who is there as something self-conscious. It becomes now possible to relate ourselves to the God as another self-consciousness, not merely as the thing at rest or some Lord that we can't relate to in any important way. And so he, he goes on and he says, um, this divine being, which was formerly not actual, but only an object over against it through this act, what act? The act of descending, the act of self-giving through this act receives the actuality. Now, actuality of what sort? The actuality proper to self-consciousness. What does that mean? Self-consciousness is actual by being in the world, by being related to other self-consciousnesses, by having a history, by having contingency. This is where the gods are becoming more and more human-like, aren't they? This is setting us up for the section that is going to follow. We're still dealing with this in an abstract way, but there's some pretty cool stuff on the horizon. This notion of the cult is already implicitly contained and present in the stream of sacred song. This devotion is the immediate pure satisfaction of the self by and within itself. It is the purified soul, which in this purity is directly only essence and is one with essence. The soul, because of its abstract character, is not consciousness which distinguishes its object from itself. It is thus only the night of its existence and the place prepared for its outer shape. The abstract cult therefore raises the self into being this pure divine element. The soul perfects this purification with consciousness, yet it is still not the self that has descended into its depths and knows itself as evil, but it is something that only immediately is, a soul that cleanses its exterior by washing it and puts on white robes, while its inward being traverses the imaginatively conceived path of works, punishments, and rewards, the path of spiritual training in general, that is of ridding itself of its particularity, as a result of which it reaches the dwellings and the community of the blessed. Coming on the heels of the two previous short paragraphs, what's going on in paragraph 715 is a very interesting, in some ways almost digression 
We've seen that the two sides have been brought together into the cult, right? The cultus in German. And now we get the, essentially the abstract cult, as he's going to call it, halfway through this paragraph. And he tells us some really interesting things about the cult. But what's more interesting is what the member of the cult, who he's calling the soul, right? Because what is a person in religious terms? Well, their soul. What the cult is doing to them, offering to them, is in a certain way a stepping away from what we've seen developed previously, and we're going to have to have something restored to it. So this is you might say, a presentation of an ascetic path or a devotional path that a person certainly can take, but it's also a bit of a misstep. So let's take a look first at what we might call the communal and uh, more objective side of this. And then we'll talk about the soul and what he has to say about that. So he tells us the notion of the cult, the concept, the begrif, is already implicitly contained and present. It's, it's contained within what? The stream of sacred song. Now, sacred song is a use of language, of utterance, shraka, all right? So it fits in with what we've been talking about up to this point. But it's, it's more determinate in a way because it has been set to another element, that of music. And so, you know, the strom, the stream, uh, th that's kind of a nice thing to talk about because in a moment he's going to be talking about purification, right? And the strom could make us think about, you know, river rituals as well as a stream of music. And it's, it's sacred song here is translating Hymnitian Gesangis. Is that the right translation? Well, it works, but it's not like Heiliga or anything like that. Hymnitian, in the form of hymns. Now, who do you, who do you do hymns to? Well, to the gods or to God, right? We talked about these hymns to Demeter and to Apollo. I, I mentioned some of them uh, a couple uh, sections back. And it is song, right? So there's this devotion is being displayed through this and the cult is also working through this he says this devotion the andact is the immediate pure satisfaction um, befriedigung a term that we've seen come up at a number of points people want to enjoy people want to be satisfied and this is one way to do it in religion, an immediate pure satisfaction. Now notice what he says after this. This is going to get us to the soul. Of the self by and within itself. So there's a very complex self-relation to self here, isn't there? And that's going to get left behind very quickly in this, that reflexive uh, connection to one's own self. It's going to get subsumed into the cult. So he says, it is the purified soul, which in this purity is directly only essence, vasen, and is one with essence. Now, what's being left out? What did we just talk about in the last paragraph? Actuality. We talked about um you know, existence, Dasein. We t and, and in paragraphs before that, we talked about the contingent, the Zufelliga, right? All of these things are being set aside by the soul of the devoted worshiper. It says the soul, because of its abstract character, isn't consciousness, which distinguishes its object from itself. It is thus only the night of its existence and the place prepared for its outer shape, what is the abstract cult doing? It raises the self into being this pure divine element. So what we have here is sort of like a fusion with a God or becoming the God or uh, relating ourselves in such a way that we lose track of who we ourselves are, the miserable, contingent, finite beings that, that you know, have backstories and aren't completely purified or perfected, right? And he goes on and he says, it is still not the self 
that has descended into its depths and knows itself as evil, as böse, as you know, something particular, something set aside, something that has its own drives, something that can be like singing in the pews and also having impure thoughts or even just distracted thoughts, uh, maybe even about, you know, what page are we on in the hymnal or things like that. Uh, I am just talking about personal experience and singing in church or uh, engaging in, oh man, my voice sounds really good today and being prideful about that. That's gone. That's being taken away. And Hegel seems to present this as if it's kind of a loss. Isn't that an interesting idea? Hegel is not an ascetic. Hegel is not a mystic in this respect, right? This is what a lot of religions promise and what a lot of religious people experience. But it's not something particularly great for the worshiper to not have what he's calling its own particularity, right? It says it's something that it only immediately is. It's a soul that cleanses its exterior by washing it, putting on white robes, right? So that's the ritual. And, you know, they're maybe in a stream or something like that. Ablutions as well as dressing up. And then he says, what about interiorly? Uh, He says, it's inward being traverses the imaginatively conceived paths of works, punishments, and rewards, the path of spiritual training in general. So, you, you know, you think about the stories, you think about how you're supposed to be, what kind of person you're turning yourself into, you know, what a great person you are, losing yourself, the particularity of who you, you've been in this new perfected self within the abstract cult. And he says, it rids itself of its particularity, as a result of which it reaches the dwellings and the community of the blessed, a whole bunch of other people like itself within the abstract cult. Is this what religion is really aiming for? It's an important step along the way. Something is being achieved and attained in, you know, mystery religions or in other sort of devotional practices, right? In the way many people approach things in the ecclesia or the church. But there's more, there's, there's supposed to be more going on. So we're going to have to look a little bit more closely at what the cult is actually providing. And, you know, this is a preliminary section in this um, big part of this portion of religion.